friends! Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Welcome to a variety show um, where we have a couple of topics we're going to attempt to cover. Um, and I will show these topics all came from the Q&A website. Um, so if you go to qna.coding.garden, this is a site where you can ask me questions and vote on questions that other people have asked as well. Um, and uh, there are a lot of questions here. <laughs> so instead of attempting to answer them all, we've, I've picked three that we're going to cover today. Um, now, you may notice that there is no YouTube chat on my screen. I have tried everything in within my abilities, and the YouTube API will not give me back the live stream ID for the YouTube stream. So if you want to chat, um, you should head over to Twitch. So if you go to twitch.tv slash coding garden, you will be able to send chat messages there. You can throw me a follow. I'll get closer to 2,000. I'm at 1,400 right now. Um, but go over to Twitch. I'll, I'll try to look back at the YouTube chat every now and then. Um, and I apologize for that. But um, not 14,000. Did I say 14,000? 1,400. <laughs> not 14,000. 1,400. Um, but it, it, first of all, this is really lame. Okay, look, I'll, I'll show you really quick. This is the response I'm getting back from the YouTube API, because I'm sending these two requests. This one says, give me all upcoming live streams for my channel ID. Nothing. And then this one is for, give me all current live streams for this channel ID. Nothing. So YouTube has something against me. Yeah, so drops will not work on YouTube. <laughs> Just head over to Twitch. Uh, let me see if anyone said hello. Hello, Ben. Um, and hello, Ayali. Let's see. Hello, Avi. I'm doing pretty good. Hello, Uvaraj. Hello, Vouter. Hello, Domenico. Hello, Francesco. Hello, Vouter. Hello, Douglas. <laughs> Hello, Retta. Hello, Ayub. Um, Ryan says, my goal this year is to make a career change from MarTech into software engineering. Oh, I think like marketing tech. Love learning new skills from your channel. That's great. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, Dippo Pam says, yes, we have React. I'm going to try to cover some React today. React and Electron. Um, and hello, yes, sir. Okay. That's pretty much it for the YouTube chat. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna use um, the this chat over on the right, which is mostly just Twitch, um, and we'll talk about the things. Um, so let me just catch up on all that. Hello, Sergi. Hello, Acid Spark. Hello, Katoli. Thanks for the follow, Hadger. And hello, Infi. You're not late. You're early. I would say. <laughs> hello, uh, uh, Ed Xeno. Welcome. Hello, Sternholm Dev. Hello, Mattia. What's up, Alka? With the hype. And hello, for, hello, Kajoma. Um, Sterholm says, how do you disable the chat translator? Uh, I think it's an overlay that you can hide. I'm not quite sure. I've never really experienced it from a viewer perspective. And hello, free debugs. Hello, Steven, who says, YouTube is dead. <laughs> uh, I possibly used up your API quota. I don't think so, because I would have gotten, instead of actually getting back a blank response, um, I would have gotten back... Uh, you have you have exceeded your API request quota, but I'm literally getting back that there are zero upcoming live streams and zero currently live streams for my channel. Um, if anyone else wants to give it a try, feel free. Um, you can get my YouTube channel ID from my um, from my YouTube channel, <laughs> and then try to call their API to get a list of at currently live streams. If it works for you, then maybe I'll try my API key. But yeah, and hello DG uh, DG. Uh, go to the bathroom to debug that? What? <laughs> and hello, Rock Code. I'm doing pretty good. I was uh, sick earlier in the week, but I'm feeling better. And thanks for the follow, Zenark. And yo, Zenark. Obligatory view is better than React message. I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Uncheck visible. Cool. Good call. The Chinese flu. What? Uh, no, I, I definitely didn't have the flu. I didn't really have a fever. My throat was a little scratchy. My stomach was upset, but I'm feeling better. Okay, so today, the plan is to talk about these three things. So there was a question that came from Karan, who is a Droplet YouTube member. Uh, and uh, Karan asks, can you show some code or explain how workers work in Node.js? Thanks. Um, so yes, I will. And uh, let's see who else voted for this. Cananello and Depopam voted for this question. So we're going we're gonna to talk about this one. Um, after that, I think we'll talk about creating like a basic proxy API. Actually, it might... <laughs> It might be very relevant to create an API that calls the YouTube API, and we'll put it behind a proxy so it hides our API key. 
Um, but that question was by Harsh, so we'll build a basic Node app that does that. And then this question from Pranjal um, says, please tell me how to use React Router with an Electron app. It seems React Router and Electron hate each other very much. Um, I can show you how to do that. So there are like Electron React starters. We could probably set it up from scratch, um, but we'll do that as well. But the order is workers, then proxy API, then Electron and React. Let's get into it. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, Katoli says, for the worker threads question, I have a repo with some algorithms implemented with it. Cool. And so um, I'll talk about this, but essentially, worker threads in Node.js um, allow you to write parallel code. So um, if you're not very comfortable with the JavaScript event loop and uh, parallelism and uh, like promises and callbacks, th this stream is going to be a little bit advanced for you. And I'm not going to start from nothing. I'm assuming that you have used callbacks before. Um, you know a little bit about promises. We're not going to really use promises, but the idea of asynchronicity, the thing, the idea that multiple things can be happening at once is going to come into play when we're talking about worker threads. Um, so never used a callback in my life. Is that a joke, Stephen? Because I, I feel like you write JavaScript on a daily basis. Uh, I haven't tried Dino, but I looked at it. It looks pretty cool. And hello, Nar. Um, cool. See you later, DJ, uh, DG. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, but okay, worker threads. And so this was added, I believe, in Node.js 13 and allows you to uh, spin up multiple threads that can actually uh, share memory and communicate with each other. So um, you may have heard before that Node.js works uh, as a single threaded process and JavaScript is single threaded and that really only, for the most part, one thing can be happening at a time. Now, before worker threads, there were things like a uh, child process um, and like another thing that would let you potentially spin up a separate process or a separate thread. But the cool thing about worker threads is that they introduce uh, shared array buffer instances. So they can actually share memory. Um, and the, uh, okay, Catoli is saying it's been in Node since V10, but with experimental flags, but now it's actually there and you can just straight up use it. Yeah, so this is, we're gonna be doing some multi-threaded programming. Uh, and this is itself a pretty advanced concept because um, most programming that you learn is very serial and that you're you're writing your code as if only one process is, is running that code and it's, it's most likely going to run it sequentially. It's going to run it from top to bottom. But what, inter what uh, paral parallelism introduces is the idea that we can mul work on a problem in parallel um, instead of just w using one process to work on that thing. Um, so, uh, and Katoli mentioned that they have a repo of, uh, algorithms. And so that's actually what I did this morning. I did a little bit of research to find what is an interesting algorithm that we could implement that can benefit from parallelism. So we're going to, we're going to work on that. Um, let's see what else was said. And Alka says, I avoid callbacks as much as possible. Cool. And hello, tram stars. <laughs> oh, cool. Obviously, started learning C++. So with C++, you can do parallel type stuff. Um, at my very first job, I worked with people that did C++ on supercomputers. And that's like massively parallel programs. So you would write programs where you could have thousands of instances all working at the same time and all working on the same problem together to solve that problem faster. Um, but now you can do it with JavaScript. It's probably not going to be as fast as C++. Um, and... Yeah, but we'll talk about it. Uh, Infi says, recently built a proxy API for fetching my Discord user info, which uses a Discord bot. Behind the scenes, because Discord's non-bot API is really lacking. Interesting. Uh, can I show a quick overview on how calls and promises work? The thing is, um, not really, <laughs> because I'm only going to be streaming for like two hours. So I, I have done previous streams on like the basics of promises and stuff like that. And when I come across it, I'll try to explain it, but I, I can't start from nothing just because it, it would take too much time. And also, I have the, the only preparation I've done is I've pulled up this article on worker threads. Um, I found this very, very good overview um, from uh, Masij Silsar on um, the Log Rocket blog called A Complete Guide to Threads. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but if you want to learn about threads from scratch in a more in, in a better way <laughs> about somebody who actually knows something, you can go through this guide and he, he walks you through what used to exist, what exists, exists now, all that good stuff. So I'll share this article. Um, but um, well, we'll look at this maybe every now and then if we need some help. But for the most part, I'm just going to be going from, 
<laughs> the uh, Node.js documentation. And if you're jo if you're joining late on YouTube, uh, currently um, YouTube is not listing my stream. So I'm not able to get YouTube chats because I don't know what the live chat ID is. So if you want to if you want to chat, <laughs> head over to Twitch, twitch.tv slash coding garden, and I will be I will respond to your chats there. Okay, and if anybody else shows up on YouTube, please tell please please point them to, to Twitch. Tell them to go over here. Thank you. All right, continuing. Um so it's been stable since V12. That's good. Clusters in Node. That's actually that's a it's a different thing. So um, clustering allows you to um, again spin up a process, but you can have multiple worker threads, but they can't ha share memory. The the main, at least from my understanding, the main thing about worker threads is the fact that they can share memory. Yeah, multi-threaded programming. <laughs> Does it have real world implications? Yes. So there are certain problems that are paralyzable, meaning they could be. The problem itself can be broken up into many different chunks, and each of those little chunks of the problem can be solved by one separate thread or separate process, and then they can all put their solutions together to come up with the final solution. Um, and so this has, this has serious real-world applications. Um, this is where supercomputing um, comes from, if you've ever heard of that. The idea is you, you have a server farm with thousands and thousands of processors, and um, it has ways of sending problems that can be split up to all those different processors. They do the work, they send back their results, and then you can you can finish that problem much, much quicker, much, much faster. <laughs> yeah, and um, things that aren't Node.js actually do spin up um, separate threads or processes for incoming requests. So if you've ever worked with really PHP or even ASP.NET, um, when you're building a backend application, um, requests that come in might actually be running on a different thread or a different process, uh, meaning your code could be executing at the same time. With Node.js, that can never really happen because it's single-threaded, uh, but we're going to get there. I did not work at the CIA. CIA. <laughs> uh, and thanks for the follow encoding. And hello, uh, regards from Chile. Very cool. Uh, I'm going to talk about it raw code. So basically, we're going we're gonna to solve a problem using multiple threads. And this computer that I'm writing the code on has... Four processors, <clears throat> sorry, uh, has one processor with four cores. So it would make sense to split up a problem into four chunks and solve it f potentially four times faster than if you just did it uh, serially. So we'll talk about it. <laughs> the thing is, with a single threaded process, you can't really have race conditions. I, I know people talk about this all the time. Uh, like they might, they call it a race condition, but it's not the same thing as a race condition in um, in a scenario where you actually have multiple threads. Like with Node.js, there just really aren't. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hello, Ricky. No, I wasn't ignoring you. <laughs> um, you probably can do GP GPU programming, but um, I haven't done it before. And hello, Julian. Welcome. Hello. Hello, Sean. Um, okay, so let's say IIS is multi-threaded. So um, typically when people are deploying uh, ASP.NET, they put it behind an IIS server, which is like the Microsoft thing, and that thing will actually spin up multiple instances of your ASP.NET app. At least that's, that's what I'm familiar with. Yeah, rendering video, 3D scenes, machine learning, um, all these types of tasks can be split up into parallel tasks. So for like rendering video, you could split that up into four separate tasks. So each task, will render just a section of the video. But instead of doing it sequentially, they're all doing it at the same time. And then when they're all complete, you smash it together and you've rendered a video a whole lot faster. Yeah, all the good stuff. Okay, let's get coding. Um, and uh, let, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so I don't know exactly know what we're gonna do just yet, but I will mention the problem that we're going to implement is um, the sieve of uh, er Erotosthenes? Erotosthenes? Eratosthenes, <laughs> which is an algorithm for finding prime numbers. Um, yeah, so we're going to use, hey, hey, Danny Fritz. Yeah, we're going to try to use shared array buffer um, to basically share memory between the worker threads. Oh, interesting. I did not know that, MV. That's good to know. I'm, I'm way behind. It's been years since I did ASP.NET. But uh, so this is an algorithm for finding prime numbers, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, and 
um, it works like this. So first, you write out all the numbers up to the maximum possible prime number that you're, you're trying to find. So in a simple example, you write out all the numbers from 2 to 15. So we're going to find all prime numbers that are within this range 2 to 15. Um, the next step is you find the smallest number and you circle it. Because in this case, if you're starting this low, the smallest number actually is a prime number. You then go through all the numbers that you've written out and cross out any multiples of that number. So basically, after we found 2, which is a prime number, uh, we cross out every number that is a multiple of 2, so every even number. And now we're left with numbers that potentially are prime. And then we repeat the process. So we find the next smallest number, which is 3. That's also a prime. We cross out any multiples, so like uh, 6, 12, um, 9. Um, those all get crossed out. And now we're left with uh, 5, which is our lowest. We cross out any multiples, which would be 15. And so now 5 is a prime. We have 7. We cross out any multiples. There are none. So we have 7, we have 11, and 13. So all the prime numbers less, less than 15 are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. So this algorithm that I just showed you, the idea of you take the lowest number, cross out all the multiples, take the next lowest number, cross out all the multiple num uh, multiples. Um, this is a way of finding prime numbers, and it's known as the sieve of Erotophis. <laughs> How do I say this? Erotophis? Erotothenes. Erotothenes. The sieve of Erotothenes. But the idea here is that this algorithm can actually be paralyzed. Um, and shout out to showdoor.org. This is a website for like learning computer science that this was this was like the best description I could find of the algorithm. But there's that. But let's think about how we can parallelize this thing. So our first step, which is to write out all the numbers, we can actually paralyze parallelize that. Showdoor. Showdoor. <laughs> I um I'm subscribed to number file, they're really cool. Um, oh, Catoli also implemented it too. So if you link your, your repo, Catoli, we'll take a look at it in a bit. Um, but think about this first step. You could have a program that writes out all the numbers from one from 2 to 100, right? That program um, would start at 2, then it would write 3, 4, 5. It could write all of them out. But we could actually split that up. If you have four cores, what if each core wrote out 20 numbers? So core 1 wrote out the numbers 1 through 20. Core 2 wrote out the numbers 21 through 40. Ro core 3 wrote out the numbers uh, 41 through 60, or something like that. Um, but basically split it up so that each one is writing out a different set of the numbers. We have parallelized this simple problem of writing out all the numbers. And I think that's the first thing we're going to try to do with worker threads. We're going to take uh, four worker threads that each try to count up to, well, that ultimately are creating an array with a thousand elements in it. Um, and they each split up the task of write it, writing the numbers into that array. Um, so that can be parallelized. Um, choosing the smallest number cannot be parallelized, because you can only really do that once. Um, so when we're talking about worker threads, there's this idea of the main thread. The main thread is kind of like the orchestrator. It could be the thing that spins up other threads and um, the thing that receives the results when the other threads are done working. So the main thread is going to choose that number. Um, but then this next process of crossing out all multiples, that can be parallelized, because each separate thread could um, have a section of the array. It could receive the number that it's trying to check multiples of. And any numbers within its range that are multiples, it can cross out. Um, so that can be parallelized. Um, and then we repeat the process, choose the lowest, which has to happen on the main thread. And then we split up, split up the work. Um, yeah, let's go to showdoor.org. <laughs> it does look really old. Um, but is a national resource for comp computational science education. I, I found I found this PDF by Googling, and it's it's the best description that I could find. So um, in this in this PDF, I'll share it really quick. Um, they talk about the the par the serial serial algorithm, which is just one process or like one thread. Um, they also talk about the um, how you would take that algorithm and parallelize it. Cool. But what I think our first step is, is we're going to write a program that uh, creates an array with all the numbers from 2 to, I don't know, 10,000. And we're going to try to parallelize that so it happens on multiple worker threads. Um, and again, uh, for anyone that's watching on YouTube, I don't have YouTube chats right now. Oh, there it is. Finally! That took way too long. That took way too long. Man. <sighs> <laughs> what 
Wait, did, how did, why did all the Twitch chats go? Oh, because the Twitch chats were on a different uh, chat ID. Okay. I can't say hello to everyone, but um, YouTube chat is not working again. Are there two? Oh my goodness. Come on. <laughs> oh. Okay. I think it was duplicating Twitch chat. It should be okay now. <laughs> Twitch chat wasn't a different word either. No, actually, um, the way my backend code is set up is horrible, but uh, ultimately it just had two TMIJS clients that were both listening on the same thread, that just using um, like callbacks to know when a message came in. So that, that wasn't separate threads. Okay, uh, let's try to write this thing. So th the first the first thing we're gonna try to do is write a shared program that um, uh, fills up an array of length 10,000. All right, new file, um, fill array.js. <clears throat> oh, okay, thank you, Katoli. So these, these are the algorithms that Katoli implemented with worker threads. So we'll definitely check those out. Um, but I want to try to implement them without looking at his code because it'll be fun. Nice, very cool. We'll keep that there. And hello, coder. Um, hello, Ashwin. Right now we are working on implementing something with worker threads. Okay. Um, so worker threads are built into Node.js. So I am currently, I think I'm using Node version 13. Let's see, we can do Node-V. Yeah, I'm on Node version 13, so I don't have to npm install anything. This is just a plain JavaScript file. I'm going to require in worker threads. I don't have to install anything, it's just built in. So if we look at the docs here, we can create a worker here. Uh, and actually we can, we can destructure it. We'll do what they're doing here. Like this. Okay, so we have uh, worker is main thread, parent port, and worker data. Um, then we'll just do like a simple if statement. We'll say um, if is main thread, we're just going to log hello from the main thread. Else, we're going to log hello from the worker thread. And like I mentioned, I know nothing about this. This is the first time I'm coding with it. I believe if we run this code, we're only going to see a message from the main thread. Let's see. Uh, because we haven't spun up any worker threads, and we actually need to manually create a worker thread. Um, so if we go into this folder and we run this file, we just see hello from the main thread. So right now, we're not spinning up any workers, so we're only on the main thread. Now let's try to spin up some workers. Um, and I believe we'll use like this worker thing. But let's see. Uh, we'll talk about it, Ember. But basically, um, crossing out in this scenario, we're just going to set the value to zero inside of the array. That's the scenario. How many iterations have to be done so the rest of the numbers are 100% prime? You just need to go through your entire list of numbers. So your first step is to list out those numbers. Um, and you start from two. Like, you have to start at a low number, like a prime number. Otherwise, your lowest number um, wouldn't be crossed out, even though it's not prime. So you do have to write out all of the numbers. And then you have to go through all the numbers that you wrote out. And when I say write out, I mean we're going to put all of those numbers inside of, of an array. Um, yeah, so let's keep going. So I have a worker. I want to create a worker. What do I do? There's the worker class here. So uh, represents an independent JavaScript, JavaScript thread, um, and we can create an instance of it. So um, if this is the main thread, we're going to create a worker. We have a message channel, and then we can post messages to it. OK, we're going to do something like this. <laughs> Aerotosthenes. Aerotosthenes of Serene. Thank you, Motivation. <laughs> um, you potentially could do this client side with uh, service workers, but I don't, I don't know about shared memory in the browser. It's probably possible. Yeah. Um, OK, let's try to do something like this. So we're going to create a worker. 
Um, and you'll notice that we're passing in file names. So th this is a special variable in Node.js that refers to this specific file. And ultimately what we're doing is we're creating a worker that's gonna be running the code in this JavaScript file. We could technically define our code in a separate file and start the worker from there. But for now, we're just gonna start it up in this file so that way we can see hello from the worker thread. Um, and really, I think that's all I'm gonna do. We're just gonna create one worker and we should see hello from the worker thread. Let's go. There we go. So hello from the main thread and hello from the worker thread. Um, so we start the code up. The main thread is running because when you start it up, that's the main thread. And then it starts up a worker thread that runs the code, which says hello from the worker and we're good to go. So um, in this scenario, um, we're actually going to, we're gonna have to predetermine the number of workers that we need. So that way we can split up our problem. Is my CPU at 90% now? No, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, Danny Fritz is saying, shared array buffer is Chrome only. I've been tracking a meta issue for re-enabling shared array buffer in Firefox for months, on Firefox for months. Cool. Yeah, and shared array buffer does exist in uh, Node.js, so you can use it there. And hello, code with Dinesh. <laughs> uh, hello, AG Gamer, uh, who, whose name is uh, Abdul Salam, um, who is asking, do I recommend, if you're good at teaching, to start a YouTube channel? Absolutely. Um, let it be known that it, it takes a while to build a YouTube following and to create a channel that people want to watch, but we, we can never have too many programming tutorials on the web because everybody learns differently. Everybody teaches differently. So you can find your audience. That's, that's my, um, words of advice. <laughs> and hello, uh, Mutasim, uh, Mut, Mut, Mutasamin, welcome. Uh, can this be expanded to hardware? Like, could you have multi-threading applied to processors, having a master processor and in amount of slave processors? Uh, I don't know if that question makes sense. It might make sense, but <laughs> um, but ultimately, uh, multi multi-threading uh, is like it's like a it's a software thing because um, threads. The idea of a separate thread is really just an operating system level thing. It's not on the hardware itself. So physical hardware, I have one CPU on on this thing. Um, and that one CPU has four cores. Now, technically you could think of each of those cores as its own separate CPU, but then it's software that's able to spin up multiple threads on that CPU. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know the nitty gritty details. Like I said, we're just going to make this work. And right now we have a very basic program. And honestly, in reading all of this and in reading this article, I haven't found a program this basic. So I think we've made good progress so far. We basically explained when this code runs, it's on the main thread. We spin up a worker just by saying new worker, uh, and it's gonna run on the worker thread. So um, let's say we we actually have, um, let's have four workers. Um, so I can say like this, uh, workers equals uh, an array. And um, I wanna spin up four different worker threads. So let's just do this. While workers.length is less than four, we're going to uh, spin up a new worker and then push it into the array. So I'll say workers.push worker. So now when I run this code, we should actually see four worker threads. Let's see it happen. Boom. <laughs> um, and now I can use this to keep track of them. Now I can use this to post messages to them. So we can see in here, um, it uses ports. So we're creating a channel. Um, the worker is posting a message on a given port. And that's the way that they're going to communicate, but cool. Um, so Dow Democracy is asking about Node.js worker threads versus PM2. PM2 uses cluster. So um, if we just look at Node.js cluster, this is a built-in module to Node um, that allows you to potentially spin up multiple processes. So a single instance of Node.js runs in a single thread. To take advantage of multi-core systems, the user will want to launch a cluster of uh, processes to handle the load. Um, you would think uh, clusters works on processes, so each one is a separate process. Worker threads are threads. Threads exist within a single process. That's as much as I'm going to say about that. <laughs> uh, any of the typed arrays implement shared array buffer. Cool, yeah, so we could create a shared array buffer of numbers, a shared array buffer of strings, that kind of thing. Uh, if I write console log under that statement, will it trigger on both threads? Absolutely, um, because ultimately I'm only running this code because it's the main thread. But if I log right here, what's up? 
<laughs> um, that's going to run for every single thing. So from the main thread, from the work and from each individual worker thread. Um, so th there's nothing special about this code except for this if statement. And the main key right here is when I say new worker, I'm passing in the file name, which is this specific file. So every worker thread is going to run all of the JavaScript in this file. But the worker thread, because of the way this works, it knows that it's not the main thread, so it's not going to execute this code. Um, the way that we're going to use this is all of the code in here is like the orchestration code. This is going to um, basically tell the worker threads what to do, and then they're going to communicate back to the main thread. And then our code for the worker thread is going to go in here. Um, technically, we could create a totally separate file called like uh, worker and pass that file name in. And then we wouldn't need this if else statement, but I think it'll be simpler to just leave it all in the same file. OK. And hello, so welcome. <laughs> uh, the drop game is probably broken. Let's reset it. And there's a new leaderboard because now we have uh, an actual live chat ID. And hello, man on the run. Code with Nash says it's hard to grow as a YouTuber. Yep, you just got to make videos, be nice to people, all that good stuff. Uh, being able to take four core processors and add them together to get eight. Two four core processors and add... Yeah, uh, that, that happens by default. So um, your operating system is going to give you um, that many... Um, um, cores that you have access to. You're going to have access to eight cores. And, um, and actually, um, server hardware does this. They actually have multiple processors. Um, and a lot of times those processors can have like 30 cores on them. If you've, if you've ever heard of the Xeon processor, that's what they use in server equipment. And a lot of um, um, server racks or server, server boards actually have two processors on them, which gives them the combined total of those two. But it's hardware that's making that happen. Uh, probably. I, I, need, I need to get coding. We've, we've been here for 30 minutes. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, not sure. I don't really, I don't know of any, uh, real world, real world, um, uh, using background workers. Uh, why is this useful? Because we can take a problem and solve it faster by splitting it up into separate tasks. Um, not that I know of, but I would say, honestly, just try to understand this documentation because, um, this this documentation is a lot better than other like documentation for other things that you might be using in the programming world, uh, and you have to get used to reading documentation. So, just trying to parse it and understand it, um, I think, is a is a good exercise in becoming a better programmer. Um, honestly, though, it it kind of sucks that I have to say that. Like, <laughs> it it would be better if there were a better alternative, but I I don't really know of one. <clears throat> Uh, those threads are stored um, underneath the hood. Honest, like I said, I don't know anything. Just let me code this thing. Stop asking me questions. I don't know. I know nothing. <laughs> um, but the thing we're about to do is we're about to uh, fill up an array of numbers with our worker thread. So that's that's the plan. Um, so now we have to pa post messages back and forth between these things. Yeah, and that's the problem we're solving. Yeah. And hello, uh, Elzox. Welcome. Yeah, so a uh, multi-core processor with clusters, which spins up separate processes. Threads are different. They're within a process. <laughs> yeah, the, these um, CPUs have 128 cores. The EPYC, yeah, it's crazy. And hello, Danielle. For sure. Very good. OK, let's go. Um, so now we need to post messages between threads. And the first thing we're going to, we're going to try to solve is we're going to fill an array with the numbers, let's say two to 10,000. Um, so for that, we need a, um, a shared array buffer. I am going to go to this article cause he does talk about creating one. Um, let's see this thing. So, um, they're creating a new shared array buffer for an int 32. Um, and we have the number of elements. Yeah, so we're gonna do we're gonna do something like this, and um, actually, um, let's do this. We're gonna let's first do everything on the main thread. Let's not spin up any workers, and we can time and see how long it takes. So um, what we need to do is um, 
on the main thread, we're going to create um, this array. So let's say we want 10,000 elements, like so. Um, we're going to create a shared array buffer. And um, so if you've ever programmed in a lower level programming language like C++, um, typically you have to do things like this. You have to pre-allocate your arrays. So in JavaScript, you just create the arrays. You can change the length. You can remove things. But with something like in a shared array buffer, um, you have to predefine the link. Um, so you have to, um, in this case, we're saying we're going to find the number of bytes per element of an int 32, and we're going to multiply that times the number of elements. So this is actually going to allocate memory for this array. Um, and basically, we're saying how much space does each integer take up, and how many of them do we need? So we multiply them. Um, then we have that shared array buffer and we create an int32 array with that shared array buffer. So int32 array is a typed array. Um, and that means we can only put integers into this array. This isn't like a regular JavaScript array where you can put anything you want inside. This one can only have int32 numbers. Um, and the fact that we're using the shared array buffer uh, makes it so that um, the separate threads all have access to that exact same memory. So we're not going to be copying things back and forth. When a worker thread is running, it's accessing the exact same memory and updating the exact same memory. So that's why we're using a shared array buffer, because for these separate worker threads, they need to be able to access that memory as well. Um, OK, so right now, I'm not going to spin up any workers. Um, we're just going to create a for loop that goes from um, 0 um, all the way up to number of elements. Um, and then we'll, we're going to, um, yeah, so there We'll figure it out. I honestly don't know. I think we're going to have to do something like this. Um, because the, here's the thing. If we put this code up here, every single uh, worker thread would create their own array. We don't want that. We really just want to create the array on the main thread. And then we're going to allow the worker threads to talk to that main thread. Um, OK, so um, we go from i equals 0 up to number of elements. Um, and I mean, really, we we actually want to start at one. Um, because one is technically a prime number, right? <laughs> worker data. OK, we'll use worker data, this thing, in a second. Um, but I do want to just do it on the main thread first. So uh, what I should be able to do, I think, is just say uh, array at that index equals a number. So I'm going to say array at i equals um, I. And really, you know, I actually I want i minus 1 because we're starting at 1. I want it, I, we're starting at the number 1. I guess technically we could do this at i equals i plus 1. So what this should do is give us an array of length 10,000. First, let's just do length 100 um, so we can actually log it out. Um, and um, yeah, I guess what, technically we should start it too. So we'll say i plus 2, 0, so it would be 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, we'll do i plus 2. <laughs> so that way our array will start at 2. Cool. OK, now after all this, let's just log the array. And we should see all the numbers from 2 up to um, 102 or 104. Let's run it. 101. So. Um, this was all done on the main thread. We created this array of numbers. Great. Now what I want to do, instead of creating this entire array on the main thread, I want the worker threads to do part of the work. So one worker thread is going to fill the first section. Another worker thread is going to fill the next section. Another is going to fill the next. Another is going to fill the next. And where this is useful is the fact that they're all going to be doing it at the same time. So let's do that. <clears throat> I could do i equals 2, well, i is less than number of elements plus 2. But I want to do um, uh, array at i is the thing. And thanks for the follow, Monkey Martin. <laughs> 1 is not a prime number. It's only divisible by itself and 1, right? <laughs> uh, and thanks for the follow, r square code. Uh, what did free, free debugs do? Are they, are they dropping Rickrolls? Is that what's happening? 
Ah, I see. That's good. Thank you, Acid Spark. So one is not a prime number. We're going to start at two. Great. Um, if we go up to 10,000, this should actually compute, like, yeah, it finishes very, fairly quickly. Let's add a zero. Let's add another zero. Let's add another zero. Another zero. Let's add another zero. <laughs> um, <clears throat> is this actually working? Yeah, outside of the bounds of the buffer. So here we go. So we have a really big number. <laughs> and you'll notice that that took a second. Instead of completing like instantly, it takes a second, right? Uh, and I think this is, this is a good spot. Let's actually time this. Um, someone mentioned console.end time. Is that a thing? One E7, for example. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm using, um, SETI black, SETI dark. If you do exclamation mark VS code, you'll see a link to all my settings. Um, okay. So let's do this. We'll just say, uh, start time equals, uh, date dot now. And then in time is here. Console dot time end. We're going to do this. <laughs> A uh, variety show is we're just going to do a bunch of different things. It's basically a Q&A stream, but don't ask me any more questions because there's already a bunch of questions. Um, so we're just going to log um, in time minus start time divided by a thousand seconds. And we, we won't log the array. Here we go. That's not right. Do I need to divide by 10,000? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I need to wrap this in parentheses. So uh, in time minus start time divided by 1,000. So to fill up an array with, let's see, um, one, two, three, that's one million. Is this a billion? Yes, this is one billion. So. <laughs> To fill up an array with 1 billion integers um, takes, at least on my machine, in a single thread, uh, 2.6 seconds, roughly. Um, and hopefully we're going to speed that up. So using worker threads, they're all going to fill different sections of the, of the array in parallel, and hopefully we can get this done in divided by four time. That's the plan. That's why we're doing all of this. Okay, there are performance hooks. This is <laughs> uh, add underscores to the number for readability. Oh, how do I do that? Oh, yeah, this is a new thing. Let's do that. <laughs> there we go. One billion. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we learned about that on a, a stream a while back. Cool. OK, so uh, now how do we split this up into multiple workers? I don't know. I don't really know, but we get, we're going to figure that out. Um, Katoli mentioned worker data. Um, Let's see what we can do with this. So an arbitrary JavaScript value that contains a clone of the data passed to the thread's worker constructor. The data is cloned as if using post message. Um, I don't know if we want to clone, though, um, because that would copy the data. I'm going to look back at this article to see how, how this is doing things. Um, it is doing post message. And then in the parent thread, We're changing it in both threads. OK. I see. I think. I don't know. We're going to figure this out. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think we actually want the worker data. So let's do this. Um, for now. Like, this, this is our end goal, a billion elements, and we're going to find all primes less than a billion. Eventually, we're going to get there. But right now, let's just do um, 100. Just to see it work. And this is, like, super fast anyways, like, zero, zero seconds, basically. Um, but now, whenever we spin up a worker thread, um, we're actually going to pass in that data. So 
what we saw here is um, you say the file name and then you can pass in worker data. So our worker data here is going to be that array. So the worker data is um, the array itself. Um, and ultimately, we are going to um, not fill it up in the main thread. Um, but now that I'm, when I spawn up a worker, um, it has the worker data. Let's do this. Let's just say I have the worker data. And that's going to just be uh, worker data. Like that. So in the worker thread, they have access to that array. Let's try it. There we go. So the main thread fills up the array, spins up some threads that each have access to that same, well, didn't mean to do that, <laughs> have access to that same array. <laughs> A billion, uh, they're not, they shouldn't, they're not doubles, they're uh, int 32s. Um, but let's see if I can share, like, yeah, let's see if I can do it. It works. Um, so that, that array of a billion integers can be shared between all the workers. <laughs> so yeah. It should only be one copy. The, the thing here was saying was that it's cloned, but I think the idea of it being a shared array buffer means that it's actually not cloned. It's talking to the same instance in memory. But yeah. Okay. Um, so now we actually want our workers to fill, fill up... Um, um, the array. So let's do this. Um, our workers will have some some metadata as well. So not only do they have the array, we'll give them the start and end of where they should fill up the array. Um, it's not quite that evil because um, these are literally separate threads. And if you're using something like child exec, and you were to post a message, it literally copies the data from one thread to another. This has access to the same thing in memory. It's not really just passing by reference. It's, it's more than that. I'll say that. Um, OK, so part of the worker data, I'm going to pass in the array itself. I'm going to pass in uh, the start of where they need to start filling. Um, OK, yeah, so it clones the reference, sure. Um, so, um, when we're splitting up this task, we're going to split it up into four. So we need the number of elements per thread. Elements per thread. And that's going to be number of elements divided by four. Um, and yeah, so that should be fine. And the start is actually going to be um, workers.length times the number of elements per thread. And the end is going to be the start plus the number of worker, uh, number of elements per thread. and um, end. So uh, workers dot length, no, actually, no, start plus number of elements per thread. OK, so for right now, uh, we're not going to fill the array. Um, and we're not going to log the time or anything like that. I just want to make sure that each of my worker threads has the right start and end, because we're splitting up um, this problem into um, uh, four, four different sets. And I think this should work. Let's see. So when it logs the worker data, um, we should see, actually, I want to log uh, start and end. And really, I, I could I could number the um, the the worker so it knows where it's at. Let's just say um, let's call it index, <laughs> and this is just going to be workers dot length. Um, so now in the worker data, or sorry, in the worker, 
we're going to log um, worker data dot uh, index worker data dot start and worker data dot end this is the plan all right let's go um, number of elements per thread is not defined oh I have num elements per thread and thanks for the follow uh, Christian Gali welcome to the show um, and thanks for the YouTube sub Shaman okay cool evil yeah so it's I, I would I wouldn't I wouldn't think about it as passed by reference though because that's like a totally different thing when you're working in single threaded JavaScript I don't know I'm probably wrong I don't know um, okay so um, and you'll notice these execute at different times right <laughs> um, so it's funny because the um, yeah they're, they're it's executing in parallel so really the the first process is actually like the last one the log which is weird um, but the first process is going to start at 0 and go up to 25. The second process is going to start at 25 and go up to 50. The second one is going to start at 50 and go up to 75. And then the last one is going to start at 75 and go up to 100. Um, and I think we can just be not inclusive. So they go up to and not including that number. And so each thread will will start there. Cool. So now that we have that, uh, we can actually fill the numbers. <laughs> um, so... Um, this for loop we're actually going to do in the worker thread, right? But instead of starting at zero, it's going to start at where it needs to start. And it's going to end at where it needs to end. So um, the first process will start at zero. The second process is going to start at 25. Um, we're going to fill the array. They're all... Work they're all <laughs> Try with an odd number. Yeah, so we, we'll, we'll need to account for that. Um, but right now, I think a, a billion is divisible by four, isn't it? <laughs> um, so it's going to fill up the array. And um, when it's done, we actually need to post a message. So the main thread needs to be, it, it needs to know when all the other threads are done. But for now, let's just do this. Let's just say log uh, worker data dot uh, index done. Like that. And let's do it. Um, R is not defined. Oh, yeah. So this now needs to be worker data dot R. OK. So you'll notice they're finishing at different times because they're all running in parallel. That's a beautiful thing. But at this point, they have all filled up the array. Um, and we need to post a message back to the main thread that's, that when each one is done, so we know that um, uh, I don't think less than or equal to because we want to be non-inclusive for the index <laughs> because each one starts at the start. And thanks for the follow, uh, the Salvini. Um, Evil says, to be explicit, the object you created well, as worker data was cloned. The references it contained were cloned. It's considered a shallow copy. Um... A shallow copy. I still disagree. Like there, it's it's talking to the same thing in memory. Um, well, we we couldn't clone. Like it wouldn't make sense to have a different copy for every single worker thread. I'm still under the impression that they're working on the same instance of memory. That's why worker threads are special. <laughs> That's I don't know. I'm probably wrong. Uh, and thanks for the follow, uh, Brix Brixius. Um, okay. So now we need to communicate. How do we communicate? We do that with posting a message. How do we post a message? I really don't know. Um, let's see. Message port. Instances of worker.message port represent one end of an asynchronous two-way communication channel. It can be used to transfer truncated uh, structured data, memory regions, and other message ports between different workers. So, um, We create a message channel. When they get a message, they log the message. Um, cool. So port one and port two. So I would think port one would be what we use in the worker thread. And then port two is what we would use in the, uh, sorry, port one is what we use in the main thread and port two is what we would use in the, in the um, 
no, opposite. <laughs> port two in the main thread, port one in the worker thread. I think that's what we want. Um, let's also look at message channel. So message channel also has, has ports, but let's see. Um, message channel has no methods of its own, yields an object with port one and two properties, which refer to linked message port instances. Oh, I see, I see. They're used in conjunction. So we, st we do want to create a message channel, and I think we have that. Um, we don't. It clones the array and keeps the original reference. I still, like, I don't know. <laughs> like, why would it? <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe it's a different definition of clone. That could be what it is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that. Um, clones the reference to the array, not the numbers. I like that. We're cloning the memory reference, not the actual numbers inside of it. Um, Okay, so we have our message channel. We're going to create port one and port two. Okay, evil. <laughs> then I, I totally agree. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to rename these to make it nicer. So port one, um, that's going to be the thing that's listening for the messages. So we're going to call this uh, the main port. And then port two, we're going to call this the worker port. Um, so I, I basically just renamed those two things. But... So the main port is going to listen for a message um, here. And so we'll definitely set up the start time. We don't have to say hello anymore. We're going to initialize the array. Um, and then we're going to listen for messages. So we're going to say um, uh, main port dot on message. I can import parent port directly. Is that what I want? <laughs> uh, create the channel and ports in the loop. Let's see. Hmm. But they are spinning up separately. I, let's just let's just see what happens. I'm like I've never done this before, so I want to I want to see what happens if I do this. Um, and then in here we're gonna say um, worker port dot post message and uh, we're just going to send an object with a message property so we're going to say message equals this so um the this might not work. I'm I'm receiving conflicting accounts that this might not work. But here's what here's what I'm thinking based on the docs that I just read. Uh, we create this message channel, and we have uh, port one, which is the thing that can um, receive messages, and port two, which is the thing that can send messages. So um, here we're listening for those messages. And actually, I'm just going to I'm going to log it, um, and then over here we're posting those messages. And the message we're posting is that that thing is done. So right now, the only place we're console logging is in the main thread. Let's see if this works. Could completely and totally break. Oh, we did a billion. <laughs> Let's not do a billion. Let's, uh, or did we? Um, no, we just have number of elements, 100. And really, workers can be defined inside of here. All right. Something's broken. I don't know if it's a battle client telephone, but we can read about it. Let's say I, I'm just trying to figure all this stuff out while we do it. Um, from workers to shared memory. Mm-hmm. That's about right. Typed array. And then are we going to see a diagram where they all point to the same memory instance? We don't. I don't feel like reading. And thanks for the follow, Akandoja. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Tony, stay positive. Um, for one, take a break. If you've been trying to solve problems for 10 hours, take a break. You're going to feel better if you take a break. Um, and um, it gets better, you know? Just you're burnt out right now. Take a break. And hello, Sandeep. Uh, we are um, 
trying to work with uh, <laughs> um, uh, shared workers in or worker threads in uh, Node.js. Okay, so um, Evil says, um, I need to create the channel and ports within the loop. And to actually just like pass those in in, in my shared data. Is that the idea? Um, let's look at port one. Um, okay, so creating a channel for communications. Oh, I think, yeah, this is, this is really all I need then. I just want parent port. I actually don't want to create a, um, um, a message channel. I just want parent port. Because now we can just say uh, parent port when it receives a message. And then um, we're going to post a message to the parent port, I believe. I believe that's the way to go. So bring in parent port, post the message. Yeah, and the second way is to create a message channel. Yeah, so this is for this particular problem that I'm solving, parent port, I believe, is all that I need. Um, so I'm really curious why this is freezing now, though. Let's just log the message. Oh, because now it's listening for messages. <laughs> um, though I don't think this is actually working. Oh, and for post message, do I need to pass the name of the message? I am listening for the message in the main thread. So I'm saying uh, for each worker? So I actually need that. I can just iterate over my workers array and watch for all of them being complete. Yeah, I don't know when a worker changes their status to complete, though. You need, a, you need to listen for a message for each worker. For every worker in the worker message array, do worker.on. Does that really work? Work, work, work? <laughs> okay, so instead of parent port, let's do this. Um, I think, okay, that this kind of makes sense then. So right here, I'll say worker... Basically this, but instead of parent port, it's the worker. Okay. Let's see. And Uvaraj with the super chat. That says Uvaraj. Thank you so much, Uvaraj. <laughs> uh, the workers have unionized and are, are on strike. I believe it, Danny. I think that's exactly what's happening. They basically just froze up my process. There we go. <laughs> and for some reason... They're all completing in the same order now. Oh, no, no, there we go. We get different orders. Cool. All right, that's what we needed. I'm curious to look at the docs to see where we can find that. Parent port. Okay, I should have just looked at parent port. I was assuming like the message channel stuff worked, but um, so we have parent port. It's sending a message to the the worker, worker dot once. And then, um, oh no, no, I see it's back and forth communication. So we say worker dot post message. We're sending that message to the worker. This thing is sending it then back to the parent, which then logs here. I see. Okay. So I think we're at this point, we're good. Um, so now, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see it as well. So we're, we're going we're gonna to start with just a length 100. Um, we're not going to do any of the timing stuff. And right here, let's just say, um, we'll say let completed equals zero. Um, and let's actually create a variable for number of threads. So we're going to use that there. We're going to use that there. And then um, com uh, when we get a message from them, um, really, let's just say completed true. <laughs> just, just to be uh, more accurate as to what's happening. So um, this is going to post a message. We'll say uh, if message.completed. Um, we'll say completed 
plus plus. Um, and then we'll say if completed dot length, or so completed is equal to number of threads, then we are totally done. Will this work? Okay, so we get that logged. Now, the moment of truth, we need to log the array. Um, let's just do a, an array of length 10 so we can see what happens. Uh, and then when we're totally done, we should be able to just log r. And let's see what we get. It's broken. <laughs> it's completely and totally broken. Um, so we do see 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, so we split this into 4. We should have gotten... Um, each one gets three elements. 10 does not evenly divide by four. That's a good point. So we should probably handle that. Um, let's do, for now, just to see it working. <laughs> there we go. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. All right, but let's get it working for any number of um, um, elements. Um, yeah, so for like 10. If we were to split that up, the, our logic right now says number of elements divided by number of threads. Um, we, re we probably need to math.floor that because now we have um, 10 divided by 4, and that's going to, or we could, we could math.ceiling it, um, and then we'll get an out of bounds error, but let's just do this. We'll just do math.ceiling of number of elements divided by the number of threads. Let's see what happens now. Um, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that actually works. I'm curious, um, what if we do like 11 elements? That works too. That works too. <laughs> um, let's just log this. Number of elements per thread is going to be three. So we have four threads, that one gets three, that one gets three, that one gets three, and then where the heck do 12 and 13 come from? Why is this working? <laughs> um, oh well, this seems to work. Okay, now uh, Yuvaraj is asking what does message.completed do? So um, my worker thread is posting a message with completed as true. Technically, this is the only message I'm, I'm posting, so I really could just uh, increment the number of completed threads. Um, Thirteen should give us twelve. No, it broke. <laughs> Did I break it? Yes, the maximum number there should be 12. Why is it, why is it, um, 12 through 13 has 12 elements. Oh, oh, oh. started with two, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, so that works. All right, it, it works. Um, but to, to Yuvaraj's question, <laughs> uh, debugging this is fun. Um, I feel like, isn't it working? Yeah, it's working. No, it's not. Am I one less than what I need? Um, I don't know, but there's a question from Yuvaraj. Ultimately, the worker thread is posting a message. I'm listening for that message here. And then I know the number of threads that I spun up, which is four in this case. Um, and so the moment that all of them have sent a message, um, that's when we log the array. There wasn't a, like a similar question. Make the number of workers dynamic depending on the number. Um, I don't need to. I don't want to do that because my my machine only has four cores. So like, you get diminishing returns by in just increasing the number of threads. Uh, use lodash to chunk the array into even subarrays. Nah, we can do this. <laughs> and thanks for the follow, uh, Own Key Academy. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's do this on each thread. We're gonna log um, just the the start. Um, the end. 
and the index. So uh, index 0 starts at 0 and goes to 4. Index 1 starts at 4 and goes to 8. Index 2 starts at 8 and goes to 12. Index 3 starts at 12 and goes to 16. So in this scenario, we said we had 14 elements. So the maximum possible number actually should only be um, 14, right? Yeah, the end should be 14. So it's really just our um, our last one. And do I have 14 elements? Let's also log the length of the array. <laughs> um, yeah, 14. Why not? I mean, is is this done? Oh, we could use os.cpu's. Thank you, thank you, Brixis, uh, for the number of threads. Let's do it. So we're gonna uh, require in uh, os. And then we'll do os.cpus. It gives us an array of CPU info. Then we have number of cores. This is going to break, but I just want to log what we get back. Because if it's an array of cores, then we can just get the length. Everything's going to break. Yeah. Um, speed user how do I get the number of cores I don't know we're, <laughs> that didn't work we're gonna stick with hard coding four for now um, okay better to do with the remaining counter I, I think I fixed it right I use ceiling, so I'm getting fours. So if I did uh, math.floor, would it break? Yeah, so math.floor breaks it. Uh, why can't I just use math.ceiling? I mean, this works, right? <laughs> what's, what's wrong with this? Please, like, um... Oh! Oh, and then this actually gives me back... I see. So this is each individual CPU, like each core. I see, it's an array. Um, and technically, I think it's giving me back eight because I have hyper-threading. So yeah, we could actually split it up into eight. <laughs> so let's do that. Uh, os.cpus.length. Um, but that only gave us four. Oh, no, no, wrong, wrong thing. <laughs> OS.CPU.link. <laughs> there we go. So now we split it up into eight separate processes. Um, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Length is 15. Um, please tell me, am I wrong? <laughs> See you later, Katoli. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just, uh, I was confused because it gives me back the exact same information. Um, but I guess, oh, but this is saying it's an actual core. Weird. Okay. But yeah, that's fine. Uh, I just do it part-time. I have to go to work today and I'm, I'm basically, I'm working from home, but I'm still kind of late for work. Uh, <laughs> uh, ceiling is what is giving you the start, uh, end zero to four, four to eight, even though you only had 14 elements. Um, I am a full stack engineer. Forty seven. It kind of works, right? <laughs> um I have eight cores split up into
Life choice. Okay, I think it's working honestly. So at this point, we really can just do our timing. So we're gonna we're gonna beef things up. So instead of just forty seven elements, we're gonna do a billion elements, um, and we're gonna time it. So if you remember when we did it on a single on the main thread, it took two point six seconds. Um, so now uh, we're gonna do this. Yeah, ceiling rounds up. I don't know. I could probably figure out what's going on here. <laughs> Um, so now what we're going to do is when we're, when we're done, so we're going to try to do a billion elements. It's all happening in parallel and, um, let's see, there we go. So, um, wait, did this break? <laughs> Zero, one, two, three, four, six, seven. Okay. Seven. Yeah. So seven has the last chunk, which is a billion. So, uh, now uh, we've basically cut the time in half. Um, well, less than that. So with a single, and let, let's do this. If we do one thread, um, let's see how long it takes. And hello, Sergio. So one thread takes about 2.7 seconds to complete. But when we split, split this problem up into, in this case, eight threads, um, it takes 1.1 1 .1 second to complete. Cool. The last worker thread is dying. That's possible. <laughs> and I think I think that's the scenario. Um, we're getting a, a ray out of bounds. Well, that's curious that we're not seeing anything logged here. Let's just do a try catch. Well, no, it's not dying because it's able to post the message that it's done. Because if it didn't post the done message, um, we would never be complete. But okay, this is a very simple thing we've done here. <laughs> we filled in an array of a billion elements from the num from two all the way up to uh, a billion and one or something. Um, and now <laughs> we want to do the the prime algorithm. Um, I've been streaming for a long time, a long time. Uh, Tramstars is asking how I how I move code. So if you select it in VS Code, uh, for me it's the Alt key, and you can just press up, and um, it'll move it'll move it up like that. Um, maybe um, well, and it's technically Option key on Mac. It might be the same thing on Windows. I don't know. All right, so let's let's see what it would take to now translate this problem into the C of Aristophanes. Um, so we, we completed step one. We, we wrote out all of the numbers. Um, now what we need to do, um, it is alt on Windows 2. Cool. Yeah, I, I totally forgot. I'm using like a Windows keyboard. Uh, now what we would need to do is, um, cool, it works on Windows 2, um, is our main thread would keep track of what's the lowest number. It would then ask all of the lower threads to mark off all the primes within them um, and then continue. Interesting. Just a second. Okay, but you know what? I think I'm done with this. <laughs> so, you just watched me struggle for an hour, figure out this um, worker thread API. Um, and well, we, we did at least one useful thing, sort of. It's probably not that useful, but we filled an array of a billion elements with numbers. Um, I, I, will, I will do this as an exercise for people watching. I'm gonna push my code up to GitHub, but can you take the code that I've I've written and um, complete the sieve of er erotophases, erotophanes, <laughs> to find all prime numbers in this array of a billion elements? Um, it's definitely possible. We're gonna have to do. It's gonna be more complex message passing because you kind of have the main thread that keeps track of what's the lowest number, and then all the worker threads will cross out all of the um, numbers that are divisible, and then you repeat, repeat until. Um, every number is either prime or is um, crossed out. Um, so it's a, it's an exercise for the reader. <laughs> um, I do want to get to one more thing. I, I probably can only stream for about 20 minutes more. I do have to get to work. Um, why not just slice the numbers? What do you mean, Agent Smith? Um, yeah. Thanks, Majestic Guy. Um, so that was fun. 
Exercise for the viewer. Implement the Sea of Eratosthenes. Okay. Um, we're going to do a quick vote. Do you want to see me build a proxy API? So like an API that hides an API key that talks to some third party or API, or do you want to see me build an Electron app with React Router? Let me know right now. I'm actually, I'm going to do a poll. <laughs> proxy API, uh, hide third party API key on back end. Um, or Electron plus React app with router example. Here we go. Please vote now. An option for everything. <laughs> I don't have enough time. <laughs> uh, make sure you go to the, the poll and vote. Um, and I just want to say shout out to EvilD20 for all of your help with um, figuring things out and talking about shared memory and stuff. And also shout out to Katoli. Uh, while people are voting, I'll actually bring up Katoli's repo because he mentioned he actually implement, implemented quite a few algorithms um, using worker threads. <laughs> Excuse me. So let's actually see how he did um, prime generation. Um, so we have our worker threads. Hey, he's computing a billion of them as well. We have our thread count. Cool. <laughs> this is very similar to what I did. Um, we're adding all of the threads. What is threads? Threads is, it's a set. Okay, cool. That works. And then we're iterating over them. And then, um, yeah, each one is using this generate primes function, which takes in the start, the range, the min, and the array. Cool. So it's, it's actually not that far off from what we've already coded. So that's pretty cool. But uh, check out this repo that uh, Katoli has made. There's several other algorithms and data structures implemented using worker threads, which is cool. Um, proxy, 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 proxy. Yeah, uh, Jan, this question actually came from uh, Pranjal, who's working with uh, React Router and Electron, um, which is why we're going to use React if we do do that. And hello, Percelsior. And hello, Eternal DevCoder. It's going good. Happy Friday. All right, I don't have much time, so we're just gonna go with it. Uh, and this this other question for a proxy API, we'll save that for a future stream. Um, but right now we're gonna do um, a React Router with uh, Electron app with React Router. Um, I think the, the main issue that Pranjal was happening um, is they really just couldn't get multiple routes working in an Electron app. Um, so we'll at least get that working. We'll have like a home page and an about page with React inside of Electron. Um, now, are you watching right now, Pranjal? You might be asleep. But um, let's just search for Electron React Starter. I do know that there's a GitHub repo out there um, that uses, uh, yeah, Electron React Boilerplate. That might be it. We could also do it from scratch. Um, I, I really want more recent ones. Let's say, like, the past year. But let's see, this has um, 13,000 stars. This is probably the way to go. <laughs> um, but this is a uh, foundation for scalable cross-platform applications. Uh, they have a website. Let's look at it. Yeah, hot reloading, incremental typing, build optimizations. Cool. Kind of just clone it, and you get a React app. Um, this is kind of like the Create React app plus Electron all in one. Um, and Electron, let's just talk about that first for people that don't know what it is. Um, it is a platform for building cross-platform applications. It's a, it's a, not a, an SDK, I guess, uh, for building cross-platform apps. Um, and basically, your applications can be built using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This thing you see over here on the right, this is actually an Electron app. Um, and it is literally a desktop window that has Vue.js running inside of it. Um, 
uh, to run this. And yeah, so Discord, I think there's a list of fam- popular apps. So Discord is built with Electron. Slack is built with Electron. VS Code, Atom, um, all of these things are built with Electron. And basically, it, it allows you to build cross-platform desktop applications that use web technologies inside of them. Um, it's pretty interesting. They use the Chromium browser. And within the Chromium browser, they actually give you access to native node modules. So you could basically write front-end code that's doing things like reading and writing to the file system or directly talking to a database, which is pretty interesting. Um, a lot of people don't like it because it's like big and bulky. Yeah, a bit bloated, but great for a lot of things. <laughs> um, is Spotify Electron? I would believe it. And the, the cool thing is like Discord, um, if you go to Discord in your browser, it's like the exact same app as Discord running on your desktop. Um, yeah, and I, I believe Atom was initially built with Electron, and then that like Electron came out of Atom. Um, I believe. I think that's the way it worked. Like initially, they built it so that they could make Atom Editor, and then they pulled out the guts and made Electron. And thanks for the follow, Exelon shots. Electron Forge. Let's look that up. Um, Cody is asking what tech I use on my work. Uh, we do full stack JavaScript. So um, I do React with TypeScript on the front end and then uh, Node and Express on the back end. The database differs depending on the applications that we're working on. Spotify is built with that. All right, let's look at Electron Forge, a complete tool for publishing and installing modern Electron applications. Um, create Electron app. Cool. Cool. Yeah, so there's a Proton native, which is, um, it uses this thing called LibUI. So LibUI is a, a native library. Come on, DuckDuckGo. Um, this thing, it's a native library for creating uh, cross-platform uh, desktop applications. It's a, like a GUI library written in C. Um, so um, there are wrappers for this LibUI package, which allow you to do things like use uh, uh, React or even Vue. So uh, Proton Native is basically under the hood. They're using LibUI to create uh, cross-platform desktop applications. Uh, and then there's Guido, I think it's called. Guido? <laughs> a Vudo. There it is. Guido is a, is a different thing. A totally different thing. <laughs> duck, duck, no. <laughs> um, but Vudo is very similar to Proton, but it uses LibUI under the hood. Okay. Regarding all this stuff, we gotta we gotta we gotta write some code. Um, so let's make an Electron app, and I think where I'm gonna start is actually with this uh, Electron React boilerplate. Let's actually see does it come with React Router by default? Yeah, it comes with React Router by default. So um, Pranjal isn't watching, so I'm I'm curious what problem they're having. And honestly, if they use the Electron React boilerplate. Um, it would just um, work with React Router by default. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to create a basic Electron app and try to get a React app working inside of it. Can we do that in 10 minutes? Probably not, but we're going to try. Because uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the trickier problem. Um, so let's just go to the Electron site. Um, and... We, I believe they have like just a starter. This is like the basic Electron quick start that we can clone down and get running. Let's do that. So we're going to clone the Electron quick start. Um, and this is just a basic Electron app. Um, let's install dependencies. And thanks for the follow, Shockum45. And hello, Visceral. Welcome to the show. And thanks for the follow, uh, Leshifery. Welcome. <laughs> uh, OK, so we installed dependencies. If we do npm start, we should get a desktop application. Look at us. So uh, this is Electron. And what's the interesting thing is you can uh, turn on the developer tools, and you can actually see. Um, wait, did I do the right thing? Oh, here we go. 
you can actually see that this is actually a Chrome window running in here, um, but you get access to some Node.js things. So we have the Node version that we're running, um, the Chromium version, the Electron version. We could get access to like uh, you, like system information, all that good stuff. But this is an Electron window. And so what we want to do now is write a React app that's running inside of it. Um, so let's open up code. Three minutes. <laughs> Um, and you can see how this thing is set up. So you have your uh, main.js, which actually creates the window. So this gets a browser window from Electron and then creates one with the, that height and width. Um, and then it just loads this index.html. So this is the actual page that's loading right now. Um, what I think we'll do is we'll create a React app inside of this folder. And part of our start script is to spin up Webpack in the React app. And then instead of pointing it at index.html, we're going to point it at uh, localhost 3000. Um, there are other native things you can do in here. So this uh, this is actually using separate threads. So this main.js you can think of as like the main thread that has access to all things Node.js. Um, you have, then have the renderer process or the renderer thread. I think it is processes. Um, but the renderer um, is what is running inside of your index.html. So this is a more sandbox environment that doesn't have access to everything for like a better security model. Um, but in your preload, you can expose Node.js things that will be access accessible in the renderer. But there's all that. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to generate a React app like right in this folder. Um, I think. Uh, hello, Carlos. The purpose of the drop thing is the game. <laughs> You're trying to drop on the center there. Say renderer 10 times. Renderer, 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 renderer. <laughs> um, so this probably isn't the best way to go about things, but I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to do uh, create React app. I'm just going to call it uh, app, and I'm going to generate it inside of this Electron folder. And that's true. Yeah, we haven't gotten any super high, high leaderboard scores today. And like I mentioned earlier, there's definitely a better way. So like uh, for this Electron um, React boilerplate, they've taken the time to set all of this up in a single application with a single package JSON. What I'm doing right now is basically I'm going to have two separate apps. I'm going to have my Electron app with all of its dependencies, and then I'm going to have React that's running inside of that. Um, <laughs> hold my caffeinated drink. Um, so the plan right now is in the main process, instead of just loading index.html, we're actually going to load a URL. I believe you can do main window.load URL. And here, we're just going to pass um, HTTP colon slash slash localhost, and then the port of our Webpack server, which is probably going to be like 3002 or something. We'll figure that out when we start it up. But yeah, drop game is a scam. Uh, if you do exclamation mark VS code, cot and hello cot, exclamation mark VS code will give you a link to all my stuff. So I'm using the font anonymous pro, and then the VS code theme is um, SETI black, I think it's called. Yeah, pa Pavel is saying, last time I tried custom React, it was painful to set up with, with Electron. <laughs> a provably fair verifier. Um, OK. So now we actually have this separate app folder that uh, is our React app. Let me just do an npm start here. And this is going to start up our Webpack server for React. Um, and this is running on port 3004. Cool. So on port 3004, we have a React app running. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to load that React app into um, my Electron app. So Electron, instead of loading a file, uh, we're actually just going to load the thing on port 3004. Um, and now our Electron window should just have a React app running inside of it. So I'm going to go up one directory. This is now the Electron folder, npm start. And now, yeah, there we go. So we have an Electron app with React running inside of it. Now, right now, this is really cumbersome because I have like two separate windows open. Um, I probably could use something like concurrent to run them both with the single uh, package JSON. Um, 
So let's do this. Like in the package JSON here, I believe I can add a, a post install script. So after you do an npm install in this folder, we'll say like cd into app and run npm install. Um, and then is there a post start? Yeah, and then post start, we're going to cd into app and run npm start. So uh, now if we run uh, npm start in the electron folder, it should go into the the um, our React app and start that up as well. So let's see what happens. So right now, I'm in the electron folder. We're going to do npm start. So that starts electron. And then nothing. <laughs> so post, uh, oh. Yeah, it, it actually worked after the process got killed. Um, I'll just do this. So start and then uh, concurrently do this. So in, in bash, the, uh, the ampersand, uh, a single ampersand runs it as a background task. Um, it works if I reload. Oh, I guess that's true, because it needs to start up first. <laughs> so I would probably do this then. Start up the React app first. Um, and then uh, start Electron. And I might do something like uh, sleep for two seconds. Let's just say sleep for three seconds to make sure that it's actually started up. And then start Electron. Um, here. Will this work? I don't know. So that starts the React app. Um, oh, and then I actually need to type yes, because it's running on a different port. All right, let's see if I can. No. You know what? We probably need like concurrently or something like that. <laughs> I guess if I helped, great. What? <laughs> um. Uh, I, I can't really answer that right now, Matt, because um, I got to go really soon. So I'm trying to figure this out. Um, pipe, yes, yes. Oh, okay. npm start. Echo y piped into npm start. Hey. <laughs> so that opens it in the browser. Did it end up starting our Electron app? Um, I don't think it did. Oh, we told it to wait how many seconds? Three. Sleep. How does that work in Linux? One, two, three. Oh, is this seconds? <laughs> One, two, three. Okay, we're sleeping for 3,000 seconds. That's why. <laughs> Um, I'm curious if I can tell um, Webpack to not open up. Just, I just want to figure this out really quick. Um, React start don't open browser. 50 minutes. <laughs> this is a really old issue on Create React app. Um, it looks like it got closed. How do we do it? Browser none. OK. So I'm just going to add that in my start script in my React app. So in my React app, npm start will say browser none, and then start the React script. All right, this is the winner. Here we go. We are going to start the React app. And then in three seconds, we get our Electron app that has React running inside of it. Cool. All right. <laughs> Very good. Um, now what we need is we need a uh, React app running inside of, or sorry, a uh, React router running inside of this. So um, we're going to go into our React app, which has a separate package JSON. We're just going to install React router DOM. The best responses to problems and threads are fixed it. <laughs> is this supposed to be a new emote? Um, my, my backend doesn't parse. If you just added it to my channel, my backend doesn't parse it. I can restart it, though. Uh, 
Oh, you told me to reload them. <laughs> um, which can someone try T roll to get there? We go. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Trolled. <laughs> that's good. It's good stuff. Oh, <laughs> Lamau. Um, okay, so we installed uh, React Router DOM. Good to go. So now in our React app, we'll just set up some basic routes. Um, so in app.js, uh, we're going to bring in, um, uh, we need the router. We'll call it, uh, no, we need the browser router as router from uh, React Router DOM. And typically, the way people set that up is they actually do this in their main mounted component. So I can do this in here. Um, and then we just wrap our app in a router. And so right here, we just say a router like that. And then we put the app inside of it. And so now, anywhere in our application, we can access things like link and switch and stuff like that. Um, so let's do this. This is going to be, no, this is one component. <laughs> let's just put this in a separate file that says uh, main page. So we'll call this uh, main.js. Um, say main is just a nice little functional component that returns this stuff. Ooh, that's not good. Don't do that. Um, well, that's good. We'll need to bring the logo in here. And we'll export this default. Export default main. Um, import React from React. And then we need this logo actually in our main component. Now, this is like this is like speed coding. This is weird. But yeah, now we're gonna use switch and route. So we have our main component, and actually let's just create another component. We'll just call this about.js and again it's just a component we're going to use <laughs> um how much of the 10 minutes do we have left probably like 30, 30 minutes of the 10 minutes left that's a joke i'm almost done this should just work honestly because we have um react going so let's call this the about component about and then we're just going to put like an h2 right here that says about. OK, so we have two components. We have main, which is going to show the React app, and then about, which just says about. So now we can use our uh, our switch and our routes from um, React Router DOM and also link. So um, right here, um, Let's just have a nice little div with two links. So we'll have one link that goes uh, to um, main. We'll call this, oh, we'll call it home. It just goes to slash. We'll call that home. And then um, that's separated by a link to about. And then right below this div, we just need a switch. Um, we'll wrap it in a div, but we'll have our switch. What the switch does is it decides which route to show. And so we'll have a route. Um, we'll say uh, path is slash, and that's exact. And the component is going to be the our main component. So we import our main component there. Um, and then we do the same thing with our about component, but the path is going to be slash about. And we'll load our about component. Um, so we imported that in there. Um, and then we also could add a redirect. So if you load a path that's not valid, uh, just go back to the home page. So redirect to slash like that. This should do it. So um, wait, did we actually start this up? Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> now we'll start it in the electron folder, which should start up the React app. And then it spins up this. And look at that. So we have home, we have about, we have home, we have about, we have done it. We created an Electron app with um, with routing that has React running inside of it. <laughs> Troll. Yeah, the, the drop game, um, it expects it to be in markdown format. And I think, 
I have those being passed in as images instead of like markdown. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the claps. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I don't really know, Tram Stars, what problem he was having. Um, oh, he'll probably tune in at a later time and we can revisit this. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, then you use IPC and it all implodes. No, it sh we should be fine. So uh, what's happening is our, our, main, um, our main process is actually, it has this preload stuff. Um, so I could technically give it access to... Uh, functions here. So preload is getting loaded uh, in here. So main.js loads that. So we should actually get access to those things um, in the in the in the React app. Um, let's just see really quick what this is doing. Node version, Chrome version, Electron version. Um, and I can just do this really. I can say window dot process equals process. And then inside of the React app, I should be able to log window dot process. Um, yeah, like right here. Let's, let's just see if this works. It should. So we're just gonna have a simple little um, mounted thing. So this function will only run once. And right here, we're just going to log uh, window.process. Um, and we'll open up the dev tools. There we go. Uh, we see process. We see that it has all these things like architecture. Um, it has the current working directory. Let's actually do this. Uh, window.process.cwd. There we go. So uh, because the way the Electron app is set up, our React app now has access to um, the, those things that were, ex <laughs> that were ex exposed in, um, in the pre-render uh, of the preload function. Um, and uh, we technically could install node modules and attach those to the window and use those inside of React as well. This technically works. This works. But like I mentioned, you should probably use some other boilerplate where it's all built in, ready to go. I don't know. We're done. We're done here. Let's let's go just raid somebody. We're probably going to raid Instafla because uh, that's that's just what we like to do. So if you are uh, watching on YouTube, head on over to Twitch, twitch.tv slash coding garden. And we're going to do a good old fashioned raid. This is a great emote. <laughs> you know what I need to do? Um, I need to make all of the uh, Twitch emote faces like PogChamp. How, how does the PogChamp work? PogChamp? Object. Is that good? <laughs> um, and then what are some other ones? I can do like my own version of Kappa. Um, what are some other really popular ones? Um, oh, there's the, like, the not bad, isn't there? Uh, not like this? Yeah, not like this. Where's that one? <laughs> kappa, 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 kappa. Um... What else? Oh yeah, lol. <laughs> okay, uh, we need to do a good old fashioned raid. Um, I think we'll just raid in stuff left. Let's see what they're working on. Mug Rice Krispies. That sounds great. We're going to raid Insta Fluff. <laughs> so, um, oh, and it's my sub anniversary too. That's great. Um, so, everyone made it over to Twitch that's going to make it. Do a good old fashioned. <laughs> you can always clip it later. Um, we're going to raid. Insta Fluff is an, a nice, amazing human being. He makes mug cakes, recipes, he writes code. It's super. 
super fun. When you go into the chat, you can type exclamation mark comfy and you'll get a nice uh, piece of virtual furniture. Um, it's a good place. So we're going to go over there. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. This was super fun. And wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this. Thank you.